four-time number one best-selling author and former F-18 Top Gun fighter pilot, business consultant and advisor Ed Rush has helped over 340 companies, including multinational, multi-million dollar corporations, sports teams, Hollywood celebrities, and even one of the contestants on Donald Trump's Apprentice, grow their revenue, eliminate waste, and just have more fun in their business. Well, it's been quite a journey since we saw each other last. You know, last week, if you're watching God Talks TV, you saw a clip from the event I did the week before in Bend, Oregon called God Talks Live. This is the first time I'm back in the studio uh, since then. And what a whirlwind, man. I was on my way up to Bend, Oregon, got there, connected with our amazing team up there, and almost 300 people had their lives changed by an event that's going to change the world. By the way, I'm gonna do some more of those. One is right around the corner, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, but welcome to the show. My name is Ed Rush. This is God Talks TV, and today we're talking about how to demolish mental blocks. Now, that middle word is actually probably the most important part of the entire block word. I will tell you that there was a time in my life when I thought I was bad at remembering names. You ever meet somebody who's like, you know, I'm just, I'm just not very good with names? Uh, or someone's like, I'm not very good with places, or someone's like, I'm just not very good with directions. Uh, some of those blocks they may be physical blocks, but most of those are mental blocks. And today we're going to talk about how to demolish mental blocks here on the show. By the way, do not be a stranger. Make sure that you jump into chat. That's on the right-hand side if you're on YouTube. Probably on the bottom below you if you're on Facebook or one of the other social platforms. And I'm going to be taking your questions today, maybe even a chance to get some massive breakthrough uh, on the show. God Talks Live is next. Hey, what's up, party people? My name's Ed Rush, five-time number one best-selling author, your host for the most positive place in the planet for insanely implementable ideas. Today, we're going to talk about how to demolish mental blocks. Now, uh, every time I get ready for the show, uh, I think, okay, we're going to go through the news. We're going to talk about current events. And man, every time I go to the news to like pull some news headlines, I just decided we're going to get right into the positive content. Now, there's a lot that's happened in the news over the last few weeks. And if you're, if you're watching me live, uh, you'll know, man, we're in the middle of like gas prices going up. Like people are talking about a recession or a depression. But I can tell you one thing. The most positive minded business owners I know are on the verge, on the cusp of their best year ever. Might as well be your best year ever. And let me just tell you, that idea that you need to go with the whole like economy thing, that's a mental block too. Uh, and so we're going to talk about how to knock through those mental blocks. Uh, but before I do that, I've got some uh, positive. I, I was on, um, I don't spend a lot of time on, on the socials, uh, but every once in a while I'll scroll through Twitter. And by the way, just a side little, uh, little tip, little point. Um, one of the most important things you can do is take social media off your phone. Just delete all those little apps. Like for example, when I was looking at Twitter yesterday, I had to pull it up on my, on my, um, my computer because I don't have it on my phone. It's completely deleted from my phone. Uh, by the way, while I'm talking about tips for your phone, another one of the best things that you can do with your phone is turn all of your notifications off. If you go to the settings button and go to notifications, you'll see all of the apps that you can click notifications. Hit every one of those and turn your notifications off. My theory is if I wanna look at my text messages, I'll go look at my text messages. If I wanna go look at my email, I'll go look at my email. If I wanna go look at my, I was sitting next to somebody the other day where their phone was like, mm -hmm it's just distracting, right? Why would you want your phone to tell you what to do? So think about it. We're coming into an era where you can either tell a computer what to do or a computer can tell you what to do. So if you're sitting there reacting to what your phone is, you're actually letting all the computers uh, tell you what to do. And look, if you watched uh, you know, Terminator, you know where that's gonna end up. By the way, this is on Twitter yesterday. I thought this was funny. Today's yoga pose. <laughs> Today's yoga pose is the downward spiral. That's the negative uh, outlook on life. <laughs> the downward spiral. All right, here's one I thought was kind of, kind of positive. Richard Dean says, you know, I'm not saying my four-year-old is an optimist, but while putting groceries away, he held up a bag of cookies and said, 
I'll just keep these in my room, okay? <laughs> I, think, I have a three-year-old daughter and my wife brought some cookies home. We were visiting some friends. She was visiting some friends today. She brought some cookies home. My, my three-year-old, she saw that bag of cookies come in the door. Isn't it amazing? Three-year-olds don't even need to be told that's really yummy, you know? Yesterday we were trying to teach her how to eat an artichoke. She just stuck the whole thing in her mouth. And, um, you know, it's just amazing the way the mind works. Even at three, you know, when that bag of cookies comes walking in the door, it was just like a, it was just like a plastic bag of cookies. It didn't even have a label on it. Uh, kids know that it's good. Your mind is a powerful thing. This one was from uh, Soul Nate. Uh, Nate says, jury duty is a wild concept. Whenever the government wants, they could just be like, call off work, bestie. We need you to solve a murder. Here's $15. <laughs> I, was, I was on jury duty uh, about a month ago. I mean, I got that letter. You, you've gotten the letter. You know the talk, what I'm talking about, the letter. And for two straight weeks, I called in. Jury duty, jury duty, jury duty, and I didn't have to do it. And it's funny because I don't want to do jury duty. I got enough on my plate. Uh, I got enough things to do. My wife is dying to do jury duty. She has never gotten the letter. Um, and by the way, hello, Susan from Margate, Florida. Uh, welcome to the show. If you haven't had a chance as you're jumping in, please jump in, tell us who you are, where you're from, what you do. By the way, my name is Ed Russ. Today's show is called Demolishing Mental Blocks. I'm going to jump up on the whiteboard in a second. We're going to talk about how to totally crush mental blocks. Oh, I just clicked that one. Here's another one. Matt, a very positive outlook from Matt, who said 50 years ago, if you wanted to see a picture of a raccoon, you either had to drop, have it or drive to a library. And a raccoon in a funny hat? Forget about it. <laughs> that reminds me of those Marvel, Marvel movies. And finally, finally, one of my favorite tweets from Chuck Wendig. Monday, the human body is 60% water. You're more water than anything else. Even your bones contain it, which means you contain oceans, you contain low tide, high tide, great depths, and a peculiar shallows. You also contain one hidden octopus and two ventral sharks, so that's nice. <laughs> I don't know why. I took screenshots of like 15 different things. I don't know why I thought that was so funny, but I did. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. My name's Ed Rush. We are talking today about how to totally demolish mental blocks. The reason that I'm using the term demolish and not just, you know, not uh, remove uh, is because when it comes to mental blocks, you need to take a very aggressive approach uh, to getting rid of them. Now, this happens at least once a show uh, where I drop my pen on the ground. Usually I leave it down there, but you know, today I'm amongst friends. I'm just going to go down and get, uh, I'm going to go down and get my pen. All right, so. When it comes to mental blocks, let's talk about blocks together for just a second because I'll get uh, folks who will come up to me and they'll be like, you know, Ed, I'm not, uh, I'm not good at um, this or I'm not good at that or I've never been very good at being able to do such and such. And those things all start right here. Now, we have to start someplace. So if we're going to start somewhere, we're going to start at what, what is the difference between a physical block and a mental block. Okay, so for example, this last week I was doing an event the guy in the front row, uh, who has been an event attendee of mine uh, for years, amazing, amazing guy, a huge heart and an incredible story, okay? But um, nearly 100% deaf. Because of that, he has an interpreter that will sit in front of him, and while one of the teachers is up, the interpreter will interpret the language into American Sign Language. And uh, he, he can actually uh, speak well enough for us to understand him speaking, but the person will do the, the um, interpretation. Okay, so it would be safe to say that his block, in, in, in certain cases, is a physical, right? A physical block. Now, interestingly enough, he hasn't allowed that physical block to turn into a mental block. In fact, this guy is, is a, a well-known basketball referee. He's out there on the court refereeing these, uh, these incredible games with some unbelievable athletes and he can't even hear, okay? Uh, for example, uh, let me give you another example of a physical block. Um, so I love baseball, and I know some people who are coaches at the Major League Baseball level. I know the former manager of the Angels, uh, one of the guys that coaches the Colorado Rockies. By the way, some of you who are in my mastermind group know that the co one of the coaches for the Rockies came in and joined us in the mastermind group because he's a buddy of mine, got us some tickets, we went to the game, hung out, I got down on the field. Uh, so I really like baseball, and I played baseball all through college uh, Division one level, I was a very, very good baseball player, but not a good enough baseball player to make it to the major leagues. I couldn't hit a home run 470 feet like Juan Soto did last night. 
Uh, I couldn't throw the ball uh, from receive to second base in 1.8 seconds. I could do it more like 2.0 seconds. And so my inability to become a major league baseball player is, as you might uh, have imagined, a physical uh, block for me. You know, no matter how hard I tried at age 49, you know, I'm, chances are I'm just not going to make it into the major leagues, and it would be a futile effort for me not to be able to do that. And so, uh, and so, you know, people will come to you and say, hey, you can do anything that you want to do. And the, the truth is, that's not true. Uh, you can't jump off the Empire State Building uh, without, you know, a rope or a parachute and survive. You can't jump out of a spaceship and hope to, you know, survive on space uh, nothingness. Uh, Ed Rush can't play in Major League Baseball, even though maybe I could have at one point in my life. And my friend... Uh, is unable to hear, okay? Those are physical blocks. Now, the biggest thing between these two is to understand that most people who have a mental block are treating it like it's a physical block. So let me give you an example. Um, I said this in the beginning of the show. Sometimes people say, hey, Ed, I'm not very good with names. Uh, or somebody says, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, a people person. Or I'm, I'm not an extrovert. I don't really like being around people. Or someone will say, you know, I'm just really, really bad at math. Uh, or someone will say, you know, I've never, I, I just, for some reason, I can't hold on to money. Uh, or someone will say, you know, I just, I just feel frustrated all the time and depressed uh, in my business. And a lot of times we're giving those attribu attributive, prob uh, we're attributing, sometimes I say things and sound like Elmer Fudd. I did it, I did, it's attributed. Sometimes we're attributing physical block properties onto a mental block. Now, I was at an event once, um, just taking feedback, you know, and someone from the event said, uh, Ed, they raised their hand and they just said, uh, Ed, I'm just not very good with money. And I think that the person was believing that I was going to like, you know, work through some deep seated exercise. And I certainly could have done that. Uh, but I remember his name was Vince. He goes, I, Hey, I'm just not very good with money. And I said, okay, that's, that, that problem's now gone. And everyone laughed, but I was like, that's as quick as you can get rid of your mental blocks. If you understand, for example, how the mind works, let me show you a little clip right here. This is a neuron. This is a neural network um, right now. You can see that neural network. There's one neuron on the bottom. There's one neural neuron on the left. Those neurons are beginning to connect to each other. Let me play this video one more time and just show you. The neuron on the right or the bottom and the one on the left those are reaching out towards each other and they're connecting towards each other. Let me do it one more time. This video really will blow your mind when you look at it. See those neural networks that are moving towards each other or beginning to connect towards each other or becoming one with each other? Those, that is exactly what begins to happen in your mind. If you take neural network number one and neural network number two and neural network number three, Let's say these two right now are connected, and this is the mental, I know this is a little simpler than it actually works, but let's say this is the mental connection, the pathway that I'm not very good with money, I'm not very good with money begins to work on, okay? And let's say neural network number three is the positive neural network where, and it's a thought process that says, hey, I'm really good with money. The moment that you reframe your thinking is the moment that these two begin to connect. And you know, it wasn't until recently that scientists discovered the foundation or the function of what's called neuroplasticity. That's the ability, the brain's ability to shift and to change. So for example, uh, there were moments in your life that were so very important to you. I remember when I was a sophomore, or sorry, a junior quarterback, I threw an interception in the most important game of the year. At the end of the game, the guy intercepted the ball and ran the ball back 100 yards and we lost that game. That emotion, that poignant detail, that emotion really hung with me for that entire year until the next year when I actually threw a touchdown in the exact same end zone in almost the exact same way. Uh, but you know, even though that memory was so painful and stuck with me for an entire year, man, I look back on that maybe 30 years later and I'm like, I remember it, but I don't remember what that poignant emotion. That's because I've created new neural networks around that thought or that series of thoughts. And the same is true when it comes to the blocks that you have. Now, in a moment, I'm gonna show you how to burst through those blocks. If you haven't already done so, jump in the chat, tell me who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you just joined us, by the way, my name is Ed Rush. Uh, today, we're talking about how to demolish uh, mental blocks. This is a show called God.
Talks Live. Now I'm going to show you a quick clip um, that speaks to what I'm talking about right now. It talks specifically about your mission. I'm going to show you two clips actually from a recent training. And by the way, for those of you who haven't registered for the next God Talks Live event, I'll throw the website up in just a second to show you what this is. But check this out for a minute. Let's watch this. You have this. a mission. God's given you a very specific mission on planet Earth. Amen. It's not, I just want to help people. God's given you something very specific to do. He's coded your DNA and gifted you in a very specific way. He built a lot of the experiences into your life and your upbringing and the people that you know and the places that you've been specifically to accomplish that particular mission. And here's the other thing about this mission, which is actually really important. There's no plan B. This is really strange. For a pilot, I'm used to having a backup plan to the backup plan to the backup plan. But see, God doesn't have a backup plan for your mission or your purpose. Why? Anybody know the answer to that? Created you. We created you, but at the same time, like, he created you too. So you can't do his thing because you're supposed to do your thing. Right? So there's no plan B because we all have our thing. That's why tomorrow, by the way, or later on today, I'll talk about the importance of how you think about money. Right? So if you look at somebody with money and you're like, oh man, what a jerk. What you're starting to do is block what God has for you because you don't understand the fact that one person's got a mission, another person's got a mission, another person's got a mission. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which means he can make you a millionaire, a billionaire, just like he can make someone else a millionaire, a billionaire. If you look at somebody with money and you think, gosh, you know, they have so much of it, they should probably, you know, give it out to everyone else because everyone else needs that. You don't understand that we don't live in a world with one pie, right? You know, a lot of people think there's like one pie. People go, well, if I take more, people will get less. God, that's not a, that is not an economic model that God created. What God created was entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs create more pies. We have more resources now than we ever have. Think about this for a second. Think about this. This is, <laughs> this is the irony of the world that we live in right now, because we're being led by, pe by bad people, okay? And because the news media constantly is pumping, pumping out a message that is not from God. In, in as much as you will listen to that message, you get the idea that we're living in a world where we're running out of everything. But we live in a world with more than we've ever had. Right. Ever. Yeah. Ever. The richest person 200 years ago would come into this world right now. They'd walk into your home right now. They would look at your toilet and they would go, what is this thing? Is this magic? Is this wizardry? How did you get this clean water in there? And you're like, I just go to the bathroom in that, <laughs> right? And we think like, oh God, please bless me. Look at your toilet. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. In my hotel room, I have a refrigerator and bottles of water. That's amazing. You know, people had to drink water 200 years ago, and as they were drinking the water, they were, they were wondering, is this water going to kill me today? Because it killed my friend last week, right? Now we go to the store and we drink water out of a bottle that was cooled by some magic wizardry that I still don't even know how it works. Some of you do, but that refrigerant runs through and somehow it's like always cold. That's amazing. That's amazing. I live in California. California thinks it's running out of water. California looks west at the world's largest body of never-ending water. Okay, think about that for a second. Oh my gosh, we're running out of water. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're running out of innovation, right? You, run, you have too much bureaucracy and too little innovation. When you have a lot of innovation and less bureaucracy, you have water. You have water. It's not even that hard. Israel pumps 95% of Israel's water is desalinated water from the Mediterranean. It's not even technology you have to invent. It's there. It's just simply bureaucracy is in the way of innovation. We live in an amazing world. And in that world, you have a mission. So if you look at the world and you're like, man, the government is screwed up. Well, yeah, it's screwed up because you're not there. Right? If you look at the world and you're like, man, there's just all these authors out there that are just back on boom some of you some of you were here two weeks ago when i'd had my microphone off for like a whole minute during the show at least it was short this time all right so um uh the uh um when it comes to mental blocks i will show you that short clip 
just to show you that part of thinking comes down to perspective, okay? So one of the money blocks that people will come to me quite a bit when I'm working through doing God talks and helping, helping people through money blocks uh, is people will say, well, I'm afraid that money's gonna make me into a bad person. Or I'm afraid that if I have money, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do the right thing with it. Or if I have money, then I'm gonna be taking money from someone else. And this typically comes from what I call the one pie view of money. The one pie view of money goes like this. There's a pie. And if I take a bigger piece of the pie, people will have less. So for example, recently when Elon Musk was making a bid towards buying Twitter, I don't remember how much he was going to pay for it, say, I don't know, $2 billion or something like that. Um, and I don't remember, it may, have been, may actually have been more than that. Put it in chat if you remember what it was. Um, when, when he did that, there were a whole bunch of people online who were saying, man, you know, this money could have been used for something amazing. Uh, this money really could have been used for the poor. This money could have been given away and, and helped so many people. Uh, and uh, I do find it convenient, by the way, how many people are willing to give away other people's money, <laughs> okay? But the, that mindset came from the single pie mindset, which is, you know, if Elon Musk buys Twitter with this money, there's, there's going to be so much less uh, for everyone else. By the way, in like the same week, the United States government was like, we're just going to send $40 billion to uh, Ukraine. Okay, and by the way, I'm not making, a, I'm not making a, a political point about the situation in the Ukraine. What I'm telling you is $40 billion is a lot of money to send anywhere. Okay, especially when like, have you seen the accountability for that? Like when it gets there, does anybody actually know where it goes? But, you know, just send $40 billion. But there's all these people like, Elon Musk should give his money you know, to, 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 for so much money, that's a one pie view, right? The problem with the one pie view is it's not true. It's just not true. We have more resources, we have more money, we have more abundance, we have more of everything now than we ever, 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 ever have. I'm sitting in an office with an air conditioner. An air conditioner? That's amazing, like that stuff didn't happen. It wasn't even available several hundred years ago. If you wanted your air cool, you had to open the windows, uh, you had to have a block of ice, you know, brought down from the mountains, <laughs> blow some air across it, something like that. Because in the real world, there's just multiple pies. And great entrepreneurs, what great entrepreneurs do is just create, continue, continue to create more pies. That's because we live in a world of abundance. Now, if you have a scarcity view of resources or of money, you will have a hard time attracting wealth. It will become a mental block for you. And not, not because it actually is a physical block, right? It, you, you, there's nothing physically keeping you away from money. The challenge is your mindset. And so you will end up becoming what I call a Grand Central Station for money. If you've ever seen Grand Central Station, this is beautiful place that people go through. They don't stay. There's no beds down on the tracks. It's just a station where people come through. And what I experience is if somebody's got a money block that says that I can't take more of the pie because I'm going to be taking more of it from everyone else, then therefore they begin to push money away and they end up having a money block. And I'm talking specifically about money because it's the most obvious one. The reason why money is so easy to go after as a mental block is because money has its own scorecard. So for example, you can look at your bank account and you can look at your investments, and if they're not where you want them to be, then you start right here. You don't start with what you're doing, you start with what you're thinking. Why do you start with what you're thinking instead of what you're doing? Well, on this clip, the one that I'm working through right now at my event, you can see that on the board I have the word mission, right? So I'm talking to people about their mission, but next to the mission, I'm gonna talk about results. Remember I said, if you look in your bank account, you don't see what you want. There's a reason there, and it's typically a mental block because results are, a, are as a, a result of a series of actions, but your actions are there because of a series of your thoughts. Because of the way you think, you act, and those thoughts are there because of some words that you've been saying to yourself. And so when you listen to the politicians or when you listen to the news media, and by the way, it, this is not a new phenomenon, okay? This is not new at all. In fact, Back in the late 1800s, not the late 1900s, the late 1800s, I'm talking like 130 years ago, the big issue facing the world was we were running out of whale oil. 
And everybody said, man, when we run out of whale oil, it's harder and harder to find whales. And we, when we run out of whale oil, the whole world is going to go dark. And there were news articles written about the world going dark. Uh, and there were news stories and there were people talking, I don't know what we're going to do when the world goes dark, everyone. When the world goes dark, what are we going to do? And then somebody stuck something far enough in the ground to get oil out of the ground. Listen, I don't know what your opinion is on fossil uh, oil or petroleum or what, what people call fossil fuels but really aren't. Okay, I don't know what your opinion is on that, but what I can tell you is that we've had a lot of blessing that have come from that. I understand that from an environmental perspective, we can do better. Okay, but by the way, some of the solutions that, that are better aren't even better. They're not even better, okay? Some of the solutions that are, are better aren't better. And I know we haven't found the right solution, and I'm sure that we will, okay? But until then, what I'm saying is that we've been receiving a blessing, and that's the first place to start. It, already, already, it always shocks me that somebody could be sitting in a car, okay, that's operated using fuel. They could be sitting in the car and they could be typing on their phone uh, and decrying the evils of the fuel and oil industry. I'm like, if you're going to decry the evils of the fuel and oil industry, you probably shouldn't be sitting inside that car. Or someone will be sitting at a sushi place, sipping a Starbucks, typing onto their phone into Twitter, and they'll be decrying the evils of corporations. Meanwhile, they're sipping a coffee from a corporation, they're using a phone from a corporation, and they're on a social media platform from a corporation. That's not an abundance mindset. Now, do I think you know, Twitter is the most ethical of companies? Probably not, but I'm live streaming on Twitter right now, so maybe at first I should start with thank you. Thank you, Twitter, for the opportunity to live stream, right? And then let's, let's fix some things, you know what I mean? But my point is, my point is a lot of times people come with a critic mindset or a scarcity mindset into money and it turns into a mental block for you. So if you think corporations are evil, why would you ever have one? If you think money's evil, why would you ever take money? You wouldn't. You become a grand central station for money. All right. So the first clip I wanted to show you was that one right there just to show you that the way you begin to think affects the way that you begin to act. Let's watch the second one here real quick. Getting this stuff and they're just leading people astray. Well, they're doing that because you're not there. If you look at the education system and you long, you long for people to be teaching kids right ideas. If you look at that and it, it pains you, well, part of the reason it's like that is because you're not there. Listen, it might not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. It's our responsibility to go fix all this stuff. Okay. So God's given you a mission, but what happens, this is the messed up thing about missions. It drives me crazy. Okay. So, so what happens is there's a whole bunch of people in the world who are, um, they don't have a conscience. Let me just put it that way. So you all know as well as I do that there are evil people in the world, okay? So there's people over here on the, on the evil side of the world, okay, who are multiplying their own wealth. And they have no conscience, so there's nothing holding them back. They don't really care about the rules or the laws or morality, right? A great, a great entrepreneur is a person that, that I, I just say that under promises and over delivers. Right? All you really need as an entrepreneur is a message or a product or a service that helps people. It's very simple. You saw the thing on the quote. Two things you need to be an entrepreneur. A message, a product, a service that helps people, and the willingness to ask for the sale. This is basically it, okay? Now, these folks over here don't really care about morality or anything like that, and they have wealth that's coming their way because they have no filter. There's nothing that holds them back. And yet there's all these good people over here who God truly wants to bless. Y'all know the verse right says, sinner's wealth is laid out for the righteous. Right. So the natural transfer of wealth should be from unrighteous to righteous. That's the way it's actually supposed to go. And the only way it doesn't do that is if you're pushing it away. And what happens is really good people who God's given a mission. And remember, if God's given you the mission, he's also gonna give you what? The resources, the tools, the strategies, the coaching, the help, the team. He'll give you all the things that you need. Why? Because if it's his bill, if it's his will, it's his bill. Okay. All right. So on to this, this second part right here. So I just described two different kinds of people. And actually, if you were paying attention to that, that clip, I was actually commending, commending a certain group of people in a kind of a backwards way. Okay. So 
Uh, in my experience, there are typically two types of people in the world, okay? Uh, there are good, uh, conscious, heart-centered. And then over here, uh, there are jerks, okay? <laughs> and I, I'm sorry to, to like acknowledge the existence of those. Um, my experience, um, I mean, I'll just kind of say it this way. My experience is about 90% of the people in the world are good, conscious, heart-centered people. By the way, that doesn't mean that you, um, that, that doesn't mean that you agree with them on everything. One of my biggest revelations when I became a, not a member of No Tribe, okay, here's what I mean by this. Um, Roughly 42% of the people in the United States uh, are Republicans, and roughly 42% of the people in the United States are Democrats. Uh, and by the way, if you're a member of either one of those parties, I think you're amazing, and don't get me wrong with what I'm going to say, uh, but years ago I decided to leave the tribal system uh, and become not affiliated. Um, essentially, my current affiliation is what's called NPP, uh, which is a perfect way to describe me. It says no party preference. Uh, okay, now, there's a reason for that. And I'm just going to be very direct with the reason, which is this. Uh, what I, I, had, I had some friends of mine who were completely on the opposite side of the political spectrum. And I love them. And I cared for them. Uh, and I actually thought they were great people. Now, I did believe that they had some viewpoints on the issues that were different than mine. And I thought even though they were sincere, I thought they were sincerely wrong about uh, certain issues. But I really liked them. Uh, and they're still friends of mine, you know, they come over and hang out and have beer. And, you know, we, we talk about politics, we talk about life and we talk about business. Uh, I have one, one person who I started a business with, who's literally on the opposite side of the political spectrum or used to be on the opposite side of the political spectrum. But what I realized is my ability to influence someone when I was in my little clubhouse yelling out of my clubhouse into their clubhouse was nil. In fact, you, you've probably experienced this before. If you're a member of a certain political party on either side, uh, have you ever had a conversation maybe in the last year with somebody on the other side of the political view? Um, did, I mean, was it even like worth the breath? <laughs> did they just, or did they just like look at you for like an hour like you had just grown an asparagus out of your forehead? You know, like for example, a mask person trying to convince a no mask person to wear a mask or a no mask person trying to convince a mask. But like, you might as well be talking to like, you might as well try to saddle a horse. <laughs> Sorry, you might be <laughs> a horse. You may as well try to saddle a cow, right? You're going to work really hard, but what's the point? Once you get the saddle on the cow, it doesn't make any sense to even have it on there, right? Or you talk to the vaccine person about the not, about the, about no vaccinations or the va not vaccine. You try to try it. Just try it. Just try to try to get the gun control person and the Second Amendment. No, that's no, not. It's not going to happen. Okay. But what I discovered is I really cared about these people, even though I disagree with them on some of the issues. I really cared about them, so I decided that I was going to be uh, a member of a different party. Now, by the way, the news media uh, and especially the leaders of our political parties. Remember, I said if you were if you were uh, there, I said about ninety percent of the people in the world are good, conscious, heart-centered people, and about ten percent of the people in the world are jerks. You know that the media, news media, will try to convince you that half of the people in the country are jerks? So like if you're a Republican, they want to convince you that half of the country, the other Democrats are jerks. Or if you're a Democrat, they want to convince you that half of the country, half of the country, those Republicans are jerks. What I discovered that is about 90% of the people in the world are good, heart-centered people, and they mean well. Now, they may be wrong about their issue. But like if they're one of those people that just want to like tax everybody, okay? And, you're, and maybe, maybe you're the kind of person who believes, man, you know, like the government spending is all out of control. The government's taking too much money as it is. We should be able to keep more of our money. Like if you're on that side of the issue, the person who wants the government to tax more people really has a heart-centered motive for why he wants them or she, he or she wants them to do that. Their heart-centered motive is that they want to have more money available to help people. Now, they could be sincere about that uh, and they could be sincerely wrong. You notice I haven't told you what side of the issue on any of these things I have. I'm starting to get people to start yelling at me in chat. Okay? Now, but there are these 10% of the people out there. I've met some of those folks. You know those folks. Lie, steal, and cheat. No conscience. And that's the most important thing. Is there no conscience? Okay? Now, the crazy thing is, see, these people have the benefit of having no moral filter. 
And because they have no moral filter, they don't have anything slowing them down from attracting or acquiring or building wealth. Okay, now, the natural flow of resources should be that the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. It should flow from right to left. That's the way that it should go. When I say right and left, I'm not talking about political. I'm just talking about the board, this whiteboard right now. Okay, the natural flow should be from right to left. But, but here's what ends up happening. Here's what happens. So there's like a pendulum, right? You ever seen a pendulum swing? So what happens on this little pendulum swing situation is good heart center people see these people over there with no conscience and they swing their pendulum all the way back here and say, I don't want any money. And because money's going to make me like that person. No, money didn't make that person. That person was like that person. Okay, I've, I've discovered that money is nothing more than a great big gigantic magnifying glass. That's, by the way, supposed to be a magnifying glass. Maybe the worst drawn magnifying glass in the history of magnifying glass drawings. The point is, if somebody's a jerk, the money's going to make them more of a jerk. If you're a good heart centered, conscious person, your money is going to magnify your ability to create more abundance and more value in the world. But not if you stop yourself, not if you swing the pendulum so far that you repel money because you don't want to be like that person. That is a mental block. And by the way, it can be gone literally in seconds if you simply recode your mind by saying, I reject the lie that and I choose instead to believe that. By the way, nice time right now to remind you that the next God Talks Live event is coming up in November, November 4th and 5th. I had my team re-engage this coupon code right here. You're the first people to hear about it, okay? So it's edtalks, uh, edrest.com slash God Talks. That code will not be around forever, so register for the event. When you do, you get to bring a friend. At this event, we go deep, deep, deep into the idea of how to recode your mind, and you will do it right at the event, how to recode your mind for, uh, for success. By the way, I want to say hello to some of my friends uh, in chat. What's up, Susan? Good to see you. Hey, Brett. Sign boss, my man. Good to see you again, buddy. Hey, Derek uh, uh, Hardaway, principal in, in Tennessee. Thank you for your amazing work in the education system. And there's my one of my favorite people in the world, Harisha Jones. Good word. Harisha's coming into, into town in like a month for, uh, for a Top Gun, the Top Gun speaker event. By the way, if you are a speaker or you want to be uh, you're a speaker, uh, or you want to learn how to become a professional speaker, email my team, support at edrush.com. I'll get you a ticket. Um, we'll get you a good deal to, um, to Top Gun speaker. All right, let's keep, keep cranking. Let's watch this. The way I look at it, I'm not even kidding you. I, I used to do events where I would put thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 into the event, and I wouldn't even know if it was going to be successful or not. And I've done events like this where we were net negative. That is, by the way, that's not a great way to run a business. I'm not recommending that. But in certain cases, I said, look, I'm, gonna, I'm here to do what you asked me to do, God. The results are yours. And if it's your will, it's your bill. And God's blessed me financially partly because of the willingness to say, hey, this is it. This is what we're going to do together. Okay? So like, for example, I'll do this sometimes where God just calls me away for like four days, maybe a week just to go out into the mountains or like to go stay at like a nice resort or something like that to just spend time with him. I think, man, if God's asking me to go up to the mountains, well, I guess it's his will, it's his bill. So I'm not be super, I'm not gonna stay at the Econo Lodge because I wouldn't do that with my kids. So if I'm, if I'm God's son, I would imagine he's similar to me in terms of like, I wouldn't take my kids to the Econo Lodge and be super cheap about it. I'd take my kids someplace nice. You know what I'm saying? But here's what happens. People, people hear what I just said and they're like, they're like, no, I, you know, that's just like world, it's not. All those means have been created by God. Wealth, resources, and all that stuff's God's creation. He owns it all, which means he can give it to you. And what happens is really good people get a mission from God and God starts delivering the tools and the resources and the finances and the strategy and the coaching and all the things that you need. And people, and you just push it away. And you push it away and God's trying to give it to you, but God is a respecter of people. He respects your desires and your opinions. And so he'll let you make a bad decision. You ever, you ever notice that? God's let me make, God has let me make some really bad decisions. Okay, so uh, I'll be the first one to admit it. So I am not the guy, I will not stand up here and, and do a holier than thou thing because that would not be true. Okay, so I know you're like, no, Ed, you don't understand. The worst thing I did was worse than the worst. Nope, it's probably not true. So I'm just saying, at the same time, you could stand here and go, I'm not worthy. I'm just not worthy. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. 
And by the way, all that I just said is from the pit of hell and smells like smoke. You, you're not, if you're thinking you're not worthy, you're not going to get what's just coming to you. If you're thinking that you're just, you know that people always quote that, I'm just a, and, it, and it's like, they like feel good about saying that. And I'm like, I always go, that's not in there. You show me in there without it. It's not there. It never, ever, ever, ever says I'm just anything. Never says you're just anything. And you may have been a sinner, but you're not now because last I checked, it says you're a new creation. Okay, so if you're new, then maybe if God wants to give you money, maybe you should let him. Maybe you should let him. So, uh, <laughs> somebody got... <laughs> so, I, the other day, I was I had created these um, audios. They're like 20 to 40 minutes long. They're called God Talks. And the other day, I was just trying to like get myself into like a really good mood. So, I put the God Talks on in my car. And as I was driving along... I was listening to my voice, and I thought, man, is this what it means when people say he really likes the sound of his own voice? <laughs> so, I was just listening to that clip. I'm like, oh, come on, that's good. Hey, what's up, Chris? Chris was like in charge of all the production on that event. So, if you thought that looked good, and it did, and it sounded good. All right, so, <laughs> so back to money. I'm talking about money blocks today, okay? So, you heard me on that clip say uh, a, a phrase that is the single most common when people do God talks. One of the questions they ask is, what lies do I believe about money? One of the most single, one of the most, most popular lies, if I can even say most popular lies, is the one that I said in that clip, which is, I am unworthy. In fact, when I ask people to raise their hands, because normally at the event, I'll have someone do a God talk and I'll go, all right, ask God what lies do you believe about money? And when they do, um, they'll write down the lies and then, then they ask God what's true. And s typically I'll say, tell me, tell me a couple of the ones. Someone will go, I wrote down I'm, I'm unworthy. I'll go, pause for a second. Raise your hand in the room right now if you also wrote down I'm unworthy or I don't deserve it. And like 80% of the room raises their hand. I want you to think about that for a second. That means, that means your enemy is not very creative. That means your enemy is going around whispering in the same, same thing. And you're unworthy. You're, it's impossible. You understand the kind of people that come to my event? These are amazing people with big hearts. They're going to change the world. It's impossible for 80% of them to be unworthy. So if you've been telling yourself that, it's just like I said in that video clip, which is, it's a lie, it comes from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. You know the crazy thing is, these evil people that I mentioned, those rich jerks, they don't think this. You know who think this? Good people think that. How crazy is that? How crazy is that the people who should think that don't, and the people who do think that shouldn't? It's crazy. It's crazy. And one of the money blocks is I don't deserve it. Uh, I'm unworthy or money's going to turn me into a bad, bad person or into an evil person. And it's not true. So when would now be a really great time to break through that particular money block? By the way, the way to do it, remember I showed you this little video earlier on this like neural network that's connecting. You can see these two neurons that are like reaching out towards each other and then they're connecting. You know the crazy thing about this video? This is one of the most popular videos. I, I kid you not. I play all kinds of stuff at my events. That video that I just played for you is by far one of the most popular videos. It's the most commented video. And that's because people go, oh my gosh, that's what I really can receive. And so what I will do is I'll recommend that you just recode your brain. You can recode your brain like this. I reject the lie that I'm unworthy and I choose instead to believe that I am blessed to be a blessing. Okay. Did you catch that? Very simple. I reject the lie that I'm unworthy. I choose instead um, to, to believe that I am blessed to be a blessing. I said that the enemy's not very creative, is not. And what I realized, one of the things that happens at God Talks is you find yourself around like-minded people with big hearts uh, who absolutely want to go off and change the world. And by the way, you should register for the next event. Boom. There's the link, edrush.com slash God Talks slash special. By the way, for those of you who just joined us, my name's Ed Rush. Today we're talking about how to demolish mental blocks and how to get what's yours, what's coming to you. 
the kind of money and the kind of resources and the kind of blessing that you've been wanting your entire life. And let me just tell you, not only is this a time for you to accelerate your life, your business, your career, your mission, we're also in the middle of what, I, what I'm calling a global hyper acceleration. What that means is that the entire world is accelerating. So you getting, you getting what is really coming to you, should, if it was in the past gonna take five or 10 years, it should take maybe five or 10 months because we're in this massive uh, global hyper acceleration. Let's watch more. Very simple rule. Yes. I have a very simple rule. So I did a speaking event and uh, so I speak around the world, right? So like, and I get paid to do it. You know, one of the things I, I teach people how to do is to speak and get paid to do it. So I did a speaking event uh, and I don't, I think it was like a men's group or something like that. I didn't tell them they had to pay me or anything like that. And at the end of it, they wanted to give me a check. And I can't remember what it was, a couple thousand dollars. And they said, Ed, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to give you this you know, check for $2,000. And uh, I said to the host, I said, I have a very simple rule in my business. And that rule goes, if someone wants to give you money, you let them. Amen. That's the rule, okay? So, so like, why would, you, why would you, you know what I mean? No, no, I'm just doing, I was just doing my service. Yes, I was doing my service. But I'm happy because a laborer is worthy of his wages, right? So like if God wants to, if God wants to give you money, what? Take it. Let him, okay? If God wants to bring you resources, let him. If God wants to give you the tools to be able to accomplish your mission, let him, okay? So at this event, all those barriers are going to come down, all right? For real. All the things that you've been saying to yourself, all the phony baloney things that you've been taught growing up, and I've been taught too. Okay, listen, you cannot make it through this world and not get taught some really screwed up things. It's just the way, it's just, just the way of things. So part of what God does and part of what God talks does is unveil those lies, those mistruths, those things that you've been told that sounded true, that you agreed to, and you started living your life by. God will start to show you what those things are. And if you're willing, he might surprise you a little bit. And then I'm gonna show you a method for uncoding your mind and recoding your mind back again. Does that make sense if it does say hoorah? Hoorah! All right, now, let's go down this track just a little bit. So, God's giving you a mission, a passion, a calling. And you probably haven't gotten there yet. I haven't either. All right, I'm going to show you the rest of that in just a second. But, one really important point. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually um, I used to have these quote signs all around my event, and they got lost in the mail. And I was thinking, I'm just create some new event signs. One of, one of the event signs is... Um, if God wants to give you money, do you remember what I said? Put it in the chat. <laughs> let, let him. <laughs> I mean, we, we pretend like God is the worst dad. I heard this story just last week. I have to find a new way to communicate this because I like this story so much. But they said, you know, if we treated our kids like we think God treats us with our gifts, it would be like this. It would be like, can you imagine getting a bike for your, for your kid and you're going to give it to him on Christmas. So you stay up late on Christmas Eve putting together this beautiful bike and uh, you give them the bike on Christmas morning and they're like, oh my gosh, it's a bike. And then you say, "All you need, the only thing you need to do is the only thing you need to do now that I've given you a bike. The only thing you need to do is, you know, I put this little bell on your bike. The only thing you need to do is ride around all day on your bike, ringing the bell in the neighborhood and screaming, my dad is the best dad ever. My dad is the best dad ever. <laughs> I joke with Christians because that's the way the gospel is presented sometimes, which is like, hey, you know, God gave you a free gift. So now you need to run around the neighborhood ringing a bell. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. Did you catch that? You don't have to. Now, you might want to. You might want, you might want to. You don't have to. Okay? I did this at the event. I wish I had this clip right now. I'm going to show you the, the last clip. Okay? Some of you have heard me do this before because you saw that thing. Um, Romans 6.23, which is in the New Testament, written by a guy named Paul. Okay? There's, there's a verse that goes like that. I'm just going to do it from memory, so it may not be perfect. 
It says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Okay? So, the wages of sin is death. By the way, if you don't know what that word means, all that means is you not being the authentic you. Okay? You are created to be amazing. You are created to, to be something else. And sin is you not living up to your calling. And if you want to look at the Greek, some people are like, no, it's falling short. Look at the Greek, okay? Now, the free gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You can have death or you can have life. Which one do you want? Most people choose life, which means you have to be willing to take this, which is free. Because if you want to work for it, if you want to work really hard, to get God's approval, you're going to choose this side of the equation because work and wages go hand in hand. You can't work for something that's free. So if you want to work, if you want to work, and 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 you want to work so that you can be pro approve yourself before God, then you're on this side of the equation, which is the wage side of the equation, which is also the death side of the equation. It's your choice. One more clip, and then we're going to wrap okay, it up. Okay, I'm on the way. Just like you're on the way. By the way, I'm, I'm very clear. If you want to know, if you want to know what my mission is, it's very simple. First of all, this event is a main part of my mission. I got a book coming out in September called God Talks. Surprise, surprise. Okay? Along with the book is an app. Right after the book is a certification program, which I'll tell you about later on. It's not even open. I'm just telling, I'm going to tell you the whole, the whole purpose. Then what I'm going to do is build an entire movement. I'm going to get the entire world talking to God without even knowing that they're talking to God. Right? <laughs> So like, I'm not kidding you. I've had everyone from all walks of life and every religious system who have had a conversational relationship with God. I have a person I know who for the last 40 years, she's been an atheist. She had a massive transformational experience at this event. God came and spoke to her in a profound way, broke off 12 years of abuse, completely took that off of her life. And, and she had never told anybody that story. By the way, she never told anybody about that story. She came to the event, God transforms her, Three months later, she's standing up on this stage telling that story in front of like a couple hundred people, okay? It's an atheist. I say, hey, Francine, are you still talking to God? She goes, every Friday for an hour. <laughs> she's like, every Friday from nine to 10, I sit down and I talk to God, God talks. I said, you know, you pray like more than most Christians I know. You know that, right? Like an hour a week, that's good, that's good. And my point though is part of my mission is to get the entire world praying without even knowing that they're praying. Right, because if I said to somebody, you need to pray, people are like, oh, that's what I was like, like, get on my knees, you know? Do you ever notice how weird people pray? Yeah. I'm not even kidding you. Like, remember, God is a father, yeah. and God is a really good father. So, for example, like if my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter, said, hey, Dad, could I come with you on your next trip? And by the way, she's coming with me on my next trip. Yeah. She said, if I, can I come with you? I just want to come with you. I said, Yeah. Let's do that. That'll be fun. We'll have a good time on the airplane together. I'll get us like some good like first class tickets. You know, we'll go to like a nice couple restaurants while we're there. Let's do that together. And then all of a sudden my daughter got on her knees and she's like, oh, father, honorable father who I love, please, may I go on this trip? I'm like, I said, yes, let's go. And she's like, but you don't understand. I am so unworthy. I must ask confession for you. Oh, we're good. We are, you and I are good. I know that you had a hard time last week. It's okay. You had like a little attitude. I love you. I know you're going through a tough time in your life. We're good, but you don't understand. I am so like, do you know how weird sometimes people, oh, if you like, and then every once in a while, someone will like roll like some King James into the thing. You imagine my daughter's like, thou art art. That's a word, art. That's like a verb, <laughs> art. I thought art was a noun. Okay, so like, don't be weird. God is a good father, okay? A lot of times we get this like, it gets a little weird and it gets a little religious and frankly, it gets a little creepy, okay? You don't have to... I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I, some, by the way, I had no notes. Um, those of you who came to the event heard me say this, but I have a whole note, I have a whole binder that I have for God Talks events. And... Um, and God said, don't bring your notes. So I said, all right, I won't bring my notes. So a lot of what you saw was really off the cuff speaking. We are just having fun. All right, so I'm gonna open it up for your questions, your thoughts, and your comments. What do we talk about today? So just a little review, talk about mental blocks. 
And you remember I started with physical blocks and, um, and mental blocks. I told you the story about how I was a college baseball player and how no matter how hard I tried right now, I could not be a major league baseball player. I mean, unless, you know, unless like a pandemic, uh, you know, took uh, 90% of the people off the face of the earth, I will not be a major league baseball player. Um, and even then, you know, who wants to play in front of like, you know, a couple thousand people instead of 40,000 people? My point is there is a physical block for me being able to do that. I told this story of my amazing friend who's a basketball referee, uh, who's totally deaf, can't hear a thing, or can hear a little bit, but barely anything, and needs a sign language interpreter, ASL interpreter, to be able to understand um, what someone is communicating. That is a physical block. But a lot of people treat their mental blocks like physical blocks. I'm just not very good with names. That's not a physical block, that's a mental block. I'm not good with block, that's a mental block. Um, I'm not a people person, that's not a physical block. That is a mental block. And mental blocks can go away. I mean this, mental blocks can go away like in milliseconds. In milliseconds, mental blocks can go away. We treat those oftentimes like they are physical blocks, but they're absolutely not. All right, so that begins to wrap up uh, the show today. Uh, thank you for your amazing comments and uh, your thoughts. By the way, if you had, haven't had a chance to do so, check out the next God Talks event. We're in November 4th and 5th. We're right back in Bend, Oregon. I don't know if you've ever been to Bend, uh, but we had a little over 100 people attend live, almost 200 people attend uh, the, uh, the virtual stream. If you haven't had a chance to see that beautiful part of the country, look, about half of the people who signed up to come to the last event said, Ed, where is Bend? <laughs> they don't do that with Chicago. You know what I'm saying? People don't do that with San Diego or Philadelphia or Dallas. Those are all places that have had events, okay? But uh, they're like, where is Ben? You need to start going to places that where people say, where is, and then fill in the blanks, okay? If you haven't been to, like, for example, uh, my last book I wrote on a place called Whidbey Island. People are like, where is Whidbey Island? Well, that's northwest of Seattle, you know? Um, there's a place uh, up in, uh, well, I guess a lot of people know where Monterey is, uh, or Carmel. There are some places that I've been uh, like that, which are, which are really, really great. Chris lives there. That's why he's saying, that's why he's saying it's the best, but, um, you need to go, you need to go spend time at places where people go, where is that? Like when you tell them you're going on a vacation, you're like, I'm going to Cabo. Everybody knows where Cabo is. Okay. I'm going to Cancun. Come on. People shooting each other at Cancun. <laughs> I'm going to Banff. What? Where is Banff? Banff is really nice. It's up in British Columbia. It's beautiful. You should go there. Bend, Oregon. Nobody knows where it is. That means it's awesome. And by the way, you'd be surprised at how, mu how many direct flights there are. There's a direct flight from San Diego. I think there's one from Dallas. I think there's one from Chicago. I know there's one from Seattle. Okay, so yeah, you're going to have to take two flights, but you know, use them as a learning experience. Use those flights as an opportunity uh, for you to you know, journal a little bit uh, or have a little bit of fun. All right, I'll be back soon uh, for another show. I'm going to bring back Marquetta Breslin. Some of you heard me uh, talk with her. I'm going to bring back Lisa Bruton. Lisa was just unbelievable at the event last week. In fact, next week, I, I'm pretty sure uh, I'm going to do a show uh, where I bring in a clip from Lisa teaching at the event uh, as well. Okay, so the shows here are on Tuesdays uh, at 2 o'clock Pacific. That's 5 o'clock Eastern. Make sure that you jump in the chat. Uh, there's a couple other things you get to do uh, on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, click that little thumbs up button. That tells people that you like the show. Make sure that you click the subscribe button. Next to the subscribe button, there's a button that there's a little bell. Uh, and on that bell, uh, that bell will, will basically tell you when there's a show. It'll just say, hey, there's a show and you ought to come uh, and listen to this. And don't forget that you have a mission, you have a purpose, a story, or an experience that's absolutely going to change the world. And I want to come alongside uh, and help you to do that. There's going to be some resources coming down the pike that are going to change your life as well. We'll talk to you soon. God Talks Live is out.